Hello, I'm Greg with Primal Rights. Today we're going to be talking about the real world ramifications of having a bullet seating force variation and what that can look like. So I've been working, if you've been paying attention on the channel, I've been working with the new 7PRC Primal hunting rifle, the one that I'm going to be using for all of my big game hunting this year. When I get a new rifle, I don't do load development right away. It's very important that you don't do load development on a brand new barrel. You need to get the thing stabilized first. So during the first couple hundred rounds, the barrel is oftentimes going to shift point of impact. It's going to change velocity. There's going to be quite a lot of variables. It's kind of like a teenager at that point. This is very unpredictable. I try to get a decent round count on my new rifles before I work with them in a load development capacity. I start off with just a very few pieces of brass because I don't want to use a whole bunch of brass and kind of wreck the brass if I find something that's not right. So this rifle I grabbed 10 pieces of brass and fire formed it in another rifle then brought it over to this one and I was shooting those 10 pieces and just reloading them. So I'd fire 10 reload manually those pieces of brass. I wouldn't even tumble them or anything. I would just wipe the lube off and brush the necks. And I did that eight times, so I had 80 rounds fired on this barrel. So once I had 80 rounds on this thing, I grabbed 100 pieces of my production brass because I wanted to use some of this early unpredictable barrel life to make sure that I had this brass fired in this particular rifle with a mild load and then I could count on that brass being all the same going forward. Now this hundred pieces of brass was not very well manicured. I had fire formed it but with a very mild load in a different rifle and I had it ready for shooting in this particular rifle. While I seated the bullets in this hundred cases I was doing a live stream so those of you that were here to watch that you got to see everything that I was doing while loading these cases. And of course we have a fun little question and answer session and all that while I'm doing this type of thing. That live stream is currently available for the members of the channel at the moment. If you're not a member, if you haven't joined at any level, then you won't be able to see that content. You'd have to get joined up in order to go and watch that live stream. But during that live stream, you'll see that I was commenting on the disparity of force. And normally when I'm seating bullets, I like to see somewhere between 35 and 50, 55 pounds. Maybe I'll accept 60 pounds of bullet seating force. But on this particular test, I was seeing somewhere like, I think that it started out at like 48 and I had all the way up to like 85 or 88 or something like that. So there was a solid 35 pound force disparity from the very highest seating force to the very lowest seating force. Now, conversely, when I was reloading the 10 cases and shooting that, I saw pretty normal disparity. Now, because I was manually processing that brass, I wasn't doing any of my normal bulk batch processing. It probably wasn't as uniform as I would normally see it, but suffice it to say that the extreme spread on bullet seating force was only about 10 pounds. It really wasn't that much. And most of the time, I would have my normal performance, which was somewhere around five to six pounds extreme spread of bullet seating force. So when I was reloading those 10 cases towards the end of that, I shot this target. You know, this is some pretty good shooting for a rifle that has had no load development done. And I haven't, it's a brand new barrel essentially, right? I mean, we're just, there's so much going on that should mean that I'd never be able to do this with anything regardless of what it was. And that's how it was shooting with those 10 pieces of brass that I was manicuring myself. So keep in mind here, I shoot 10, you know, this is a five shot group, this is a five shot group, and I'd shoot these 10, and then I'd go and reload those cases and then come back out and shoot these others. So this is five shots, this is three, and this is two. And you can see that, you know, the point of impact is very similar amongst them. Obviously, these 10 being a different firing, they were slightly different than the others here. And then down here at the bottom, of course, we've got 10 more. And I cleaned the barrel between here and here. So, you know, this was the first round fired on that clean bore. And then I shot four more in there and then a five shot group here. And so, folks, that's some pretty stellar performance off of a rifle that has not had load development done. 
Now, most of you have watched some of my previous content and you saw what a sub 10 pound force disparity looks like on target. And folks, I can't necessarily shoot the difference. I've never really saw a major disparity on target as long as I stayed beneath 10 pounds of force variation. And realistically, the standard deviation on most of that is probably closer to like three pounds uh, in you know, on average, probably five pounds of disparity on most of the cartridges that I load for and bullets that I seat. And so as long as you're beneath 10 pounds, you probably aren't going to be able to notice the effect of that seating force variation on target. As far as what causes this seating force variation, there's previous videos that I've done on that. You guys have to watch that stuff on my channel. Now, when we're talking 35 plus pounds, well, what does that look like? So I took that 100 rounds that I was that was seeding on that live stream that I did, and I fired those all on the same target. And this is what that looks like. So you can see here that the group sizes are significantly larger than what we saw on the earlier barrel life. So technically, this rifle should be shooting better with more rounds on it, but it's not. It's shooting, you know, I mean, I haven't measured a ton of these, but I mean, we're talking like fours, fives, and sixes here on the average. Whereas before, I mean, we're talking threes, twos, ones. <laughs> um, so this target is representative of what you would see if you've got a 35 pound bullet force seating variation. Now I bet these groups on this page look very similar to a lot of your groups out there. Now you can see that the law of greater numbers kicks in at some point and we do have a, a couple of crazy small groups here. These are half inch dots and you could take all of those shots and stick them basically inside that. This is seven millimeter bullet. So, you know, that's saying something. Now, unfortunately, I didn't grab a screenshot of the graph. On, like, for some reason, I went back to do that and the AMP program had closed. And so I didn't get an opportunity to take a high resolution screenshot. But I did grab this screen grab off of the live stream video. And you can see there that, you know, we got a pretty wide force variation. If you look at the trends on the bullet traces there, they start out relatively tight, but then they spread out over time. And this is very typical of what I see when I'm running brass that I haven't got through my process in the way that I would like and normalized all of this brass. So this 35 pound plus disparity of force, this is kind of what it looks like on target. You're gonna see, you know, two or three cluster up really tight you're gonna see a, a few flyers jumping out. Now, during the live stream, I did comment on one specifically where it set a new record. It was up like 90 some pounds of force, and it was by far and above the highest seating force that we saw. I had that round turned upside down, so I knew exactly which one it was. And what I wanted to demonstrate was that, okay, if one comes this far away from the average seating force, well then it's for sure gonna have a different point of impact. And so you can see here how most of my shots are hitting low, about a 10th of a mil, and they're hitting to the right. And so I just kind of left that there and just shot it. Now folks, a brand new barrel, as you're shooting through the first few hundred rounds, the couple hundred rounds, it's not uncommon for the barrel to shift its point of impact anyway. So don't draw too much conclusions from most other things here because the barrel being new like this, you really can't assign much value to anything. But because we shot so much, the 80 rounds that I shot prior, and they were all performed, with the exception of the first two firings, when I thought that that, that brass was actually doing really well and when I could trust it, I mean, it was just cranking little knots down there. This is actually the last group I fired, the one that's right here at this dot. I was shooting low and right, and I just kept doing that. And so that upside down round, that's this one right here, folks. I mean, it basically almost went off the page. I mean, it's just right on the edge here. The rest of the shots clustered in this little tiny cluster here. And I mean, it's, it's only, I'd say, third MLA, you know, give or take. That, that cluster of shots, and then the, the following group I shot here. 
Now you can see how that one is like significantly out. If you look on some of these other groups, you will see some of that same thing happening. You'll see how there's a trend that's kind of diagonal. This group kind of diagonal. This group kind of diagonal. This group kind of diagonal. And so, you know, this is noteworthy, folks, how when you've got bullet seating force variation, it's going to be kind of dragging you out of your node. As your rifle moves in and out of a node, you're going to have quite a bit of vertical most of the time. But there will be a horizontal element to it as well if you're able to drive the rifle well enough. So what are some key takeaways here? Well, the first one is, is that when a barrel is new, when it's got less than a couple hundred rounds on it, you can't really trust it. Another thing to note is that seating force variation is real. Well, here's a fine example of what happens when you use brass that's not well manicured and it produces a less than desirable result on bullet seating force variation. So if you're having that bullet seating force variation in excess of 10 pounds, then you really should watch more of my content and learn how to avoid that because the vast majority of that is coming from how you're treating your brass during the reloading process, what equipment you're subjecting it to, and just how good that equipment is. So in the example of 10 cases that have been fired multiple times and gone through my prescribed process for how I handle my brass, shot significantly better, I mean much, much tighter, and with far fewer flyers. You'll notice on that previous target, there was no flyers with the exception of the very first one that I fired after cleaning the rifle. Whereas with the bullet seating force variation, those groups were scattering quite unpredictably. Before we go, I'd like to share some scripture with you. For those of you out there that might be struggling to find acceptance in the world, I'm here to tell you that the acceptance of the world just really isn't that important. I'm going to be reading here from Matthew chapter 10, and we'll start at verse 11 and just carry on through verse 15. Whenever you enter, this is Jesus talking, folks. This is red, red letters, okay? Whenever you enter a city in and I should frame this in context for those of you that aren't familiar with the Bible, this is Jesus instructing his apostles that he's sending out to go and, and do ministry, to do his work. Whenever you enter a city or village, search for a worthy person and stay in his home until you leave town. When you enter the home, give it your blessing. If it turns out to be a worthy home, let your blessing stand. If it is not, take back the blessing. If any household or town refuses to welcome you or listen to your message, shake its dust from your feet as you leave. I tell you the truth. The wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah would, will be better off than such a town on the judgment day. What he's saying there is that if they don't receive you, if people are cruel to you, if people are mean to you, and you're busy trying to perpetuate truth, and they're unkind, they won't receive you, then don't even bring any dirt from that place with you when you leave. You're to leave that place, you're to walk away from those people, and don't even bring anything with you. Make sure you just leave the evil dirt there around them. <laughs> and then he goes on to say that Sodom and Gomorrah would be better off <laughs> than these cities. That means that those places where those people are that will not receive the truth, will be worse off than Sodom and Gomorrah. And of course, you are familiar, most of you, that those cities were absolutely decimated. They were completely destroyed by God. So there's a lesson in this. I mean, don't go looking for the acceptance of people that aren't going to accept you. If you find resistance, if people are not for you, it's not your job to make them for you. You might want to just leave them there right where you found them. After you leave, you can pray for them. You can bless them. Obviously, we can all hope that people would try to be nice, but uh, not, not everyone's nice. That's all the time we have for today. God bless you all, and we'll catch you on the next video.